It's a DNA problem. I was born into one of the largest Hispanic Presbyterian churches in New York City. I can assure you because of the DNA, I was not interested in becoming a minister of word and sacrament. Clearly, God had other plans for me. I went into ordained ministry in this form after 17 years of international relations and economic development. I was ordained in 94 and served the congregation for 13 years before being called to go to California to serve for the first time as executive presbyter in a presbytery where half the churches worshiped in 11 languages other than English. It was profoundly rich and humbling. I have lived in Italy, DC, New York City, New Jersey, Maine, and California, so I bring no clear identity. But most importantly, I am a child of God who sincerely believes that the relentless love of God through Jesus has something to say to us today that is relevant for us tomorrow. And as Debbie kind of alluded to, I am committed to embodying and encouraging us to remember that we as Christians have much more that binds us. In spite of all the different traditions and theological differences, we are bound by something much stronger than anything that can divide us. So with that, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God of all eternity, I ask that you silence in us the noises and distractions that we bring with us into the sacredness of this space. May our hearts be open to your spirit as we seek to be a transformed people, to be agents of your grace and love in this world. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So when was the last time you were called out to step out in faith? A moment where you were called to step into the unknown, when you were presented with taking a chance without any guarantees on the outcome. Well, one of my all-time favorite movies is Indiana Jones. Okay, do you know who Indiana Jones is? A university professor an archaeologist in search of the Holy Grail. And in his quest, he's faced with lots of good movie dramatic challenges. But one of them is this wonderful visual that portrays faithfully what it means to step out in faith. So in this scene, we see Indiana Jones standing at the precipice of a cliff and he's looking over to the other side where he's been told he has to get to in order to find that holy grail, except for one thing. This is one ridge, that's another ridge, and there's nothing connecting the two ridges. There's only this empty space. And then a godlike voice tells him in order to get to the grail, he has to step out anyway into that abyss, into that empty space and faith. And he is thinking, not really. He reconsiders his options. He looks back. The bad guys are closing in. Can't go that way. He looks down. It's a long way down. And we all know what that means. So he takes one last look at the other side and with a deep breath and frankly, a whole lot of reluctance, he steps out. And suddenly, an invisible bridge appears and takes shape, supporting him, allowing him to safely cross to the other ridge. The rest is history. The grail is safe. The movie ends. His faith, however reluctant, took him where he needed to go. Now you nor I may be Indiana Jones, maybe in our imaginations we'd like to be, 
But I'm confident that there have been moments when in faith you stepped out of your comfort zone to pursue the uncertain or the unknown. Perhaps it was when you pursued a new job or changed vocation, or when you went to college and you left your family behind, or you started a brand new grade in school, or you tried out for a team or performed a solo, you started a new business, you moved to a new community, or how about you decided to share your life with another in marriage? It's those moments where we dare believe in the impossible dreams before us, even though there are no visible guarantees. For me, a recent test was how I got to this presbytery some 19 months ago. It was Holy Week about two and a half years ago, and a member of the search committee, an unknown stranger at the time, called me while I was minding my business in California and presented what seemed like a CIA report about me. <laughs> Truly, she knew where my mother lived, where my son went to college. She told me that perhaps it was time for me to come back to the East Coast. And I remember thinking, woman, I don't know where you're getting your information, but I am home. I had developed clear hopes and expectations for the current and next season of my life, and frankly, they included swimming in my pool and staying in Southern California, serving the people that I had already come to love. Well, seven months after that first call, I spent 48 whirlwind hours with that search committee, and before getting on the plane to return to the Southland in California, they extended the call. It was a long flight home. I was like, really, God? Leave California and go where? And I'll remind you that it was one of your worst winters ever when I started on February 1st. <laughs> Even my GPS was confused. But now here I stand, convicted that although reluctantly, it is here I should be, loving a new people that I've been called to serve. And our biblical story this morning speaks powerfully to what it means to step out in faith in pursuit of God's promise of hope. When God calls Abram out of the land of Ur, he promises him not only a new place and a land, but a new generation that would come from Abram and his wife. Friends, consider Abram's reality. He is 75 years old, probably not looking for great changes, probably enjoying what has become his consistent and predictable existence, even at peace with the fact that he and his wife are barren without the possibility of children. They're at a place in their lives when they know what to expect when they rise and what to expect when they go to sleep. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking this isn't such a bad place to be. When the movement of life is predictable, is comfortable, there is emotional and spiritual comfort in this place, but it is precisely in this kind of place that God breaks into the rhythm of their lives. God breaks into the complacency of their being. God breaks into the barrenness of their existence and says, leave it behind. Go where you, go from where you are. I have a promise for you. If you step out in faith, if you go where I am sending you, to the land that I will show you, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing to the world. When you think about the Bible from beginning to end, this is a pivotal moment in the biblical witness to the people of God. The first 12 chapters of Genesis, we learn about who we are and whose we are. 
We begin at creation. We move through the fall of humanity, to the building of a tower to get to God, to the flood and destruction of the earth, to the rebuilding of generations, to this new place where God makes this promise, this covenant with Abram. Through Abraham, God chooses to bring redemption and blessings to the world. With Abram, the people of God get to begin a new journey, one that would shape the lives of generations to come through the voices of the prophets and ultimately through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to our witness and our journey in this sacred space on this morning. This Old Testament moment to go where God sends Abraham for me also foreshadows Jesus' invitation as he speaks to his disciples saying, follow me into the unknown. It reminds us, contrary to what we want to believe, that we as the children of God have always and will always be called to step out in faith, to lead the comfortable and safe way of doing things, to step into the empty spaces so that we might allow for a new place and space to be seen and embraced, one that is offered us by the God of creation. But as we know, the call to this place can be very exciting and unsettling. It's not easy to leave what we know behind, even when we know it's not all that great. But for anything to happen, for us to bask in any possibilities, when you and I are called, as a church, as individuals, our faithful response is to actually take a deep breath and take that first step. Thomas Aquinas wrote that faith has to do with things that are not seen and hope with things that are not at hand. Abraham is called the father of faith because he is open to a promise that he clearly was unable to see. And let's be clear, Abraham and Sarah, they were not perfect. Their faith did waver. But because of their faith, you and I have inherited the way of the faithful. And as inheritors of this faithfulness, we too are called to leave the comfort of what we know and step into the unknown journey of hope and possibilities before us. But friends, this isn't only about geography. This isn't about where we live or where we're moving. This is about how we live. This is about where and how we use our voices to share God's love, to respond to the injustice around us. How is it that you and I respond to the recent shootings in Oregon or the continued church burnings in our own nation that clearly are symbolic of a greater illness that allows for violence to threaten and enter even places where we worship, where we learn of our faith. We are invited to believe that our inability to see God's plans and hopes for us are far greater than our vision and that you and I, we are the vessels by which God chooses to make it happen. This is especially true in our churches as we walk through seasons of transitions. Here are a couple lessons that I want to leave you with that are really important about our journeys that I believe Abraham and Sarah teach us. First, you and I, like them, must accept the invitation. We can't go anywhere without saying yes. We have a choice. God initiates, but we are invited to respond, to say yes. We must believe that God's promise is true, even if we don't get it. Second, this one's a hard one. We must leave the stuff behind. We've got to let go of some of the trappings that make us feel secure, a trap from our past. And we love hanging on to the way things were. I love the seven deadly words of our churches. We never did it that way before. Oh, 
you know those words. We love holding on to our prestige, our status, our money, our influence, our traditions. But it is hard to move forward, not only carrying stuff, but always looking behind us. Third, the journey will take time. It will take patience. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And I think this is particularly hard in 2015 as we are part of a generation of instant response and gratification. We don't even argue well at the kitchen table anymore. My 22-year-old makes a claim, I go, let me check. And I'm on the phone. Think about that. It's a long journey. There will be stops and there will be detours. Consider the 40-year detour that Moses took. And yet, notwithstanding that, we will get glimpses of God's promise along the way. Every time we see children in front of our churches, when we baptize an infant or a new believer, when we receive new members, when our young people are leading us, when the choir sings, because they can preach here, or every time we forgive one another. Fourth, we will fail. And when you and I fail, we will experience discouragement and fear, as well as the brokenness of our spirits and bodies along the way. Abram and Sarah failed. They laughed, they lied, but they humbly stayed at it. They kept keeping at it. Fear of failure results in what I call church paralysis, which means no action. That means doing nothing. And doing nothing yields what kind of results? Nothing. Finally, always remember the words of God throughout the Old Testament as well as the words of Jesus. I am with you always. I love the moment in the wilderness when the children of Israel are making their way through the desert, away from the bondage of Egypt, with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day that guides them. But think about it. The truth is they're following without knowing what's ahead of that cloud or that fire. Haven't you been tempted to say, can you just move it over a little bit, God, so I can see what's ahead? Just have an idea. A clue would be nice. Only one truth prevailed for them and for us today. God is with us. And we too get to experience God's presence along the way with an embrace, a look, a touch, a prayer, bursts of miracles that touch and shape our hearts, giving us courage for another day. And we experience God when we gather here for worship. When we together claim that because of Jesus, you and I, broken as we are, are agents of hope in this world. I started this message with a question about the past. Well, I'd like to end it with a question about your future. As individuals and as a church family, to what unknown place of hope is God calling you? Is God calling Morrisville Presbyterian Church? And how will you respond? May you find a little bit of that Indiana Jones spirit. May you find a lot of that Sarah and Abraham openness of heart, that Holy Spirit courage to believe. And may you in confidence and faith step into those holy spaces, those empty places, knowing that the Lord is there, faithfully ready to say, gotcha. Amen.